you've just landed inside Launch Street, the innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate and differentiate and get further faster in this crazy cluttered world. And now, innovation thought leader and your super fly host, Tamara Kleinberg. Hey, Launch Streeters, Tamara here, your host and lover of the Insight Timer Meditation app. It is the best. Okay, let's talk about head trash. I think it's what keeps most of us down in that status quo dumps. In fact, have you ever noticed that the louder your mind is, the worse the head trash? And it's always negative. And that negativity, I find at least, squelches creativity. So with that in mind, I asked Matthew Ferry, who is a coach to thousands of top performers, helps them achieve um, enlightened prosperity, and author of The Seven Steps to Happiness and Success, I asked him to be on Inside Lawn Street to talk about how to have a quiet mind and an epic life. And we dug into how being tuned into life gets you to a more expansive and creative state, how we often attach the idea of risk onto the fear of losing out on an imaginary benefit. He also shared how pride, illogical rules, and not being of service actually gets in the way of a creative mind. I think this one's a little bit more woo-woo, as they say, than most of them, but it was really insightful in terms of how the mind works and how do we get to a place that actually allows for more creativity. All right, let's dig in. Matthew, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very much looking forward to uh, our conversation. Me too. Can't wait. Yeah. So tell me, what's the one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? Uh, They might be surprised to learn that I am a uh, songwriter producer who has uh, written songs for other people and had a a song chart and and that, you know, I'm sort of a nerd for trance music. What is that kind of music? Trance music. It's like 140 beats per minute. Uh, you know, probably Arm- Armin Van Buren is probably the you know most famous trance music guy out there. It's just a it's very like, rhythmic. Like rave music? It's like rave music, except extremely melodic. Oh, I'm going to have to go yes. check that out. See, you learned yeah, something cool. new. Yeah. I didn't know that was a whole category or a thing. It is. Yeah, it definitely is. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's funny. Well, that would explain why you said when we got onto Skype, let me put down my guitar. It's not something you hear every day. (laughs) Yep. I'm surrounded by uh, musical instruments and uh, that's part of my inspiration. Do you play all of them? I do. I play everything poorly. I am a jack of all trades and a master of none. Mm, But do you get joy out of playing them? Oh my gosh. So much fun. And is there one that you like more than the other ones or brings you more joy? Yeah. I, I, I I think I pick up my acoustic guitar more than anything else. That's that's my favorite. But, you know, sitting down at the baby grand piano is pretty good, too. Oh, it's so fascinating. See what you learn about people. Let's let's dig into kind of why you're on the show. I want to actually start for context. What do you mean by living an enlightened life, which is kind of the area that you focus on? And I'm asking because I think enlightened life can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Yeah, I think um, most people relate it to some kind of spiritual context. And while enlightenment um, certainly can geek you out in a super inspired way, um, enlightened really in the end just means that you're operating inside of the context of recognizing that we're all one thing, that there's a quantum field operating in the background and that we're expressing from that quantum field. and, And as such, you are a person who is devoted to operating in a very synchronized, harmonious way with all the fellow participants here on Earth. And, and uh, it's extremely efficient. It's a very efficient way of operating. Let me add, this might sound naive and actually clunky as I ask it, but as you were talking about the quantum field and that we're all connected, is it – is it fair to say that sometimes we're more tuned into that and sometimes we're less tuned into that? Or are we always tuned in and just don't know it? Does that make sense a, what I'm even asking? No, it makes, makes total sense. Um, I would say that uh, the average person is probably not tuned into it. Uh, you know, there are those people who just sort of innately, naturally tune into that kind of thing. Um, there is, I suspect, an evolu- uh, evolutionary nature to that. But, you know, you can practice. And 
Um, some people use mindfulness. Some people use contemplation or meditation or uh, maybe uh, some kind of breathing technique or maybe they are focusing on like a particular idea like kindness or cooperation or appreciation. And then all of a sudden that takes you out of the back of your brain where you're in survival mode. And it moves you into the front of your brain where all this, where you're now more creative and resourceful and expansive. And that is a very pleasurable experience. And when you are experiencing pleasure and joy and happiness and harmony, you know, you're, you're pretty badass. Is that to say then you're always happy, joyful, or is it more of kind of an overall recognition of where you are? Are you talking about me or are you talking about a person who would take this on? Uh, both, I guess. Like, how, how do you know when you're tuned in and how do we, so I was just going to your kind of comment about the back of the brain survival so mode. Simple. I find that fascinating, right? Yeah. So how do I know? It's so simple. If your mind is talking to you, fear is present. If your mind is quiet and you are aware of everything, but there's no unwanted chatter going on, then you are connected to the idea that we're all one thing. And when you are in that quiet mind state, joy is sort of the natural thing. You're just kind of naturally silly and fun and, and everything cracks you up no matter how serious it is to everybody else. And that's a very playful, creative state. It's, it's really, really, it's really awesome. Before I dig into my next question, I just want to ask, are, once you're there, is it easy to stay there or is this something you have to no. wake up every day and do? Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy to stay there. <laughs> the, wor the world doesn't care about happiness and peace and joy. The world cares about um, money, power, success, uh, protecting your children, making sure people don't take your stuff, looking good, um, being right. The world is, uh, you know, a survival framework. And really what we're talking about here is a thriving framework. And so it takes work. You have to, you have to focus on it on a regular basis. I love what you said earlier about if the mind's talking to you, fear is present, because I know when I'm in those moments, when I have all this head trash going on and conversations in my head, and I know when I don't. And it's, that's like such a great indicator, isn't it, of which kind of which place you're playing from? It's, and it's so distinct, isn't it? You know, when the head trash is going, the body is kind of like, oh, it's tight. Your focus is um, not expansive. Your focus is narrow. Um, you're, uh, you're, there's things agitate you. You know, you're not as open. And yet when you are not in that head trash place, all of a sudden you see more. You're open to more. People seem more benign. The world seems more beautiful. I mean, it's it's good. So this is the thing I wanted to ask you about, and part of the reason why I wanted to have you on the show, because these two things I'm about to ask you about seem contradictory. But you say you can both live a quiet mind and a kick-ass life. Yeah. How does that work? Well, I like to call it quiet mind epic life. Most people don't appreciate kick-ass as much as you <laughs> and I do, right? But uh, um, it, it works very simply like this. Um, when when you are in a place where you recognize that we're all one thing expressing itself with infinite variety and you see that um, uh, you and I are, are really just the same thing, but we're, um, we're just a different expression of the same thing, it assists you in being more collaborative and more creative. You're less fretful. You're less fearful. You're less uh, retracted. You don't need to go and dominate and destroy and try and amass. Instead, you're curious and you're free. And when you're in those states, when you're in that curious, free state, you're, you're still disciplined. You're still effective. You're still taking the actions to make money, live a good life, be a good parent, all of that stuff. But you're doing it in an unburdened fashion. Nothing feels important in fact, when you experience your infinite nature and when you really feel infinite, you realize, oh, my God, nothing really matters. <laughs> Which is quite liberating, right? Right, because now anything can matter that you want. <laughs> it actually – it's almost like it, it creates more space to care about the real things versus all the other stuff that gets stuck in your head. Exactly right. What Donald Trump doing is what Donald Trump is doing. It's not yeah. going to take me off track. And what my neighbor is doing with their lawn 
is what my neighbor is doing. I can create any definition that I want. The question is, if I'm going to make things up, why not make things up that feel good? Here's a question about negative mind chatter since we mentioned it again. And it's so funny or the timing of our conversation because this morning, and this has happened to me before, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, I wake up and it's like I'm halfway through my mind chatter, like I've been doing it while I was sleeping and then I woke up mid-thought and then it keeps going. How do you how do you stop that mind chatter? What, what are tools or tactics have you found to help you really minimize? Because that stuff can get loud in your head. You know, it's so funny. I, um, I've been on this journey my whole life and I, I didn't really know it. And I, I sort of went through the whole washing machine of all the um, spiritual processes and mindfulness processes and meditative and all of that stuff. And while I advocate for almost all of that stuff, what I found is in order to experience rapid enlightenment, you actually have to neutralize the mind's reason for speaking, for talking, for thinking. And the mind talks because it is a survival mechanism. It's part of our code for navigating the planet in a successful way. So one has to be able to spot greed in all of its forms and release it. Find the ways in which you're hiding yourself and not being completely authentic. Let's call that traitor, being a traitor, not really having an agenda. You got to find those things and then you have to release them. You have to release your motive for being a traitor and just get honest with yourself that it's okay to say the things that you want to say. And it's also um, uh, okay to not say certain things. But that you don't – it's not a matter of survival. Will you give me an example of that? So like, you know, I think in life a lot of us have head trash and wake up in that – like I said in the morning with that conversation that's almost halfway done. You're like, oh my god, I've been thinking about this in my sleep. Around success, failure, like, you know, am I really giving it my all? Give me an example of how you would dig into the motive of, of the trash that's in the head at that point. Let's talk about success and failure and am I giving it all, okay? Let's just, let's just take that idea. So you would, you would step back and you say, what am I afraid of? What, what, am, I, what am I attached to? So let me, let me just tell you my definition of attachment. It is the exaggerated fear of losing an imaginary benefit. Yeah, right. I like this so imaginary. We, yeah, so we imagine I'm not successful. I'm not as successful as I need to be. Now, I want you to know that I coach people who are billionaires, and they have the exact same thoughts. Yeah. I coach people who have won Grammys, and they have the exact same thoughts. I coach people who have gold medals, and they have the exact same thoughts. You can't escape it. So you have to – I'm just going to back you up and want to like nail this point on, on what you said. You actually have to examine what am I actually afraid of losing here? And what you're going to discover is that you want some kind of status or you want some kind of recognition or you're – or let's just take status or recognition. Why? Why do you want the status and recognition? Because in order to achieve a optimal survival state in the past, you had to be recognized as valuable and important. But today, you don't need that. You don't need to be recognized as valuable and important. Now, do you, if you want to make more money, do you want to give value and have people know that? Yes, but – you know, in your podcast in the past, you've even admitted it's not necessarily about being the best. It's just about being acknowledged as the best. That's specific, but it's not real. You're not going to die. So <laughs> says moment of, am I? Oh, wait, no, I'm not tomorrow. No, rein it in. Um, what, how do I shift then? How do I get a more positive mindset? Because to kind of what you were saying earlier about, you know, coming from a place of being more collaborative, creative, curious, that comes from more positive mindset, right? Yeah, but it's uh, – I, I don't necessarily advocate for positivity because what I find is it's like uh, slathering uh, um, ice cream over the top of my mud pie. <laughs> Instead, what I advocate for is is going in and recognizing where you are malfunctioning, where you're trying to survive in a world where you're definitely going to die, where you're trying to survive in a world where – 
there's no, you're not even being threatened, like really examining that. But here's some practices that I typically have people go through. So first of all, we look to see where is the pride in your life and how do we let that go? Where's the greed? Where are you being a victim? Where are you following illogical rules that don't even exist, but you keep following them, they keep hurting you, and then you keep blaming others? Where are you being humble, making yourself less than others and pretending like that's noble? So those are, those are some of the things that we might look at, but then a practice would be, okay, today I'm going to practice total and complete acceptance of all people in all situations at all times, including myself, and see what happens. You know, just for launch readers out there listening, I just want you to take a, take a deep breath. Those three words about kind of, so first of all, your pride, where's that getting in your way? Where do you have these illogical rules? I love that. And where can you be humble and be kind of of service? I love that because I think too that not only does that apply to just how you approach a world and uncovering those layers to get to that more enlightened place, I would add to that kind of from the bent that we come from with innovation, that's how you bring that creativity to the world. And I have found, and you'll have to tell me from your experience, Matthew, kind of where it fits in, that creativity, that innovative mind really gives us a lot of joy in return as well, is is giving ourselves permission to kind of think at that level. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I'm a creative person. So... Uh, when I saw that I was going to be on your show, I was like, yeah, right. This is like, <laughs> this is going to be fun. Be like too creative. Um, and, it out. Yeah, exactly. And here's the thing is that, um, for me, like the thing that has stopped me from being as creative as I had want to be in, in, in the past when I've examined it, the thing has been the illogical assumption that if I actually said the thing that I really want to say that somehow I'm going to be punished for that. Totally. And that's traitor. Yeah. And that's you, traitor. it's funny because on top of that, right, you think I'm going to be punished for it. I'm going to be punished it by, it goes back to pride. Do your comment about pride because people yep. think I'm stupid, right? Cause it's a dumb comment because it's never going to work or it defies these illogical rules that don't actually serve us really at all. We're bound by dogma that we haven't examined. Mm. We're following rules that don't exist and it's blocking our creativity. And for your tribe, it's it. I suspect that not taking on enlightened perspectives is actually blocking their ability to bring their best ideas to the market because yeah. they're they're fearing a hallucination rather than investigating and discovering, are my thoughts even real? Right. Right. I want to go back to that, your line about illogical rules, because that just absolutely intrigues me in our lives. And it just got me thinking about what are those invisible, illogical rules that I'm, I may be following in my day-to-day life or work that I don't even realize. Can you give us some examples of that or how that plays out in your clients? I'm going to give you some wacky ones to start, okay? Yep. Be cordial. Do what other people do. Follow the rules. So many people that I meet don't even realize that they're actually following the rules of religions they don't even believe in. But we're told to follow the rules. Yeah, we're told to – and – or even worse, right? It's like I'm a parent, so I have four kids, right? And – um. What I find is I'm accidentally causing them to follow rules that don't exist just to make it easier for me. Mm, Tell me more. I think about my own parents and I think about how outgoing and and, um, nutty I was as a kid. And then I think about them saying, you know, like, don't impose on the neighbors. Mm. Yes. Right, because my, you know, my natural inclination was, hey, can I have dinner with you guys? This would be super fun. <laughs> I love it. You know what I mean? That was my natural yeah. inclination. And here's my parents. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's rude. <laughs> but then, you know, later in life, you become an entrepreneur, and, um, you know, what is your job? Your job is to promote your ideas and make requests and ask and 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 get people to say yes. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't know what this feeling is inside. You don't even realize 
that you're following an illogical rule. Don't impose on your neighbors. That's I have to tell you very quickly, there's this running joke in my family with my husband and, and my kids, actually. They're nine and 13 of two boys. And they always laugh at me because they say, you know, that I believe rules exist. They just don't apply to me. That's how I've run my life. My entire life has been like, well, there are rules, sure, and you can follow them if you want to. They just don't apply to me. And it makes them laugh. And, and other parents have said to me, aren't you concerned that you're teaching your kids to just always be defiant? And my thought back was, aren't you concerned that you're not? Because right. those rules, to your point, they're just – they're so funny, the, the reason they're there. They're just – they don't make sense all the time. <laughs> And as entrepreneurs, really our job is to question everything. And to question everything, you actually have to be in a more deeply connected place. And I created a, a specific group of people where we all hang out and we we talk about breaking the rules and, and I call them spiritual hooligans. <laughs> I love that. I, I saw these shirts that said spiritual gangster and I was like, huh, am I a spiritual gangster? And then I was like, I don't think I'm a gangster, but right. I'm, I'm not definitely a rule breaker. <laughs> definitely a rule breaker. So we created our own little spiritual hooligan group. So, um, you know, I think really what it comes down to is I can't break those rules if I feel like not fitting in is a threat. If I feel like um, not having people's, um, uh, goodwill is a threat and it's just not a threat anymore. I mean, a hundred years ago, it was a threat. It's not a threat. Now we're evolving and we're evolving fast. And, um, enlightenment is nothing more than consciousness evolving. Do you think to that, that to your point about the breaking the rules or at least being willing to challenge them and think about, well, why is this rule the way it is? And should I follow it? How do you think that plays a big part in innovation? Because when I look at people and companies that do it really well, whether that's entrepreneur or intrapreneur, um, it's because they sat back and said, but but why? Yeah. I mean, that's it. That's the only that's the only thing. And and if we just step back and look at evolution, all evolution is is nature placing bets. And these new ideas are just nature placing bets. They're not your ideas. Yeah, you say why, but why do you say why? Because that's just the kind of person you are. And how did you become that person? You became that person because that's the expression of nature that you are. Right. That's your you, experience. That's your, that's your deal. You challenge the status quo. So the game is how do I just – how do I align myself more fully with being a person who challenges the status quo? And what I find is not for everybody, but for a, a lot of us creative types, if we will look at the survival programming and work to rise above it and to release it and engage our thriving nature, then our desire to break the status quo becomes less agitating and more thrilling. Well, and I think that's a huge distinction and a, an important thing to for launch readers to keep in mind because it is – it gives me a little bit of a sense of relief to know that it's more thrilling than agitating because agitating is hard. It feels like there's a lot of barriers. Um, but when it's thrilling, it's really exciting and something you want to keep doing. And I just want to kind of go back, Matthew, to something you said about you know we creative types – you know, it's it's been my experience that we're all innovative in some way, and some of us get to call ourselves creative types because of the fields that we're in or some of our skills that we have. But the truth is, if, if we're playing at that in that flow state at that higher level, we all have the ability to be innovative. But the deal is, we all do it a little bit differently. So you are really good at challenging the status quo and kind of navigating through the muck and the mud. That's okay. You took the assessment, right? So your innovator archetype is fluid futuristic, which means basically that you innovate in ambiguity and the futuristic side is you're kind of solving tomorrow's problems. Like you're seeing ahead of most of us. Other people are inquisitive. So they're all about the questions. Other people are risk takers. They're all about the leaping, but we got to get to that place that you're talking about with that collaborative, curious, free place I think to be able to even unlock that in ourselves and it, and it represents itself differently because my version of innovation isn't your version. 
Absolutely not. And we don't want it to be. No. How boring would that be? Exactly. But I think it's it's also important to admit that one, you have to figure, you have to decide, am I creative? And you have to like align with that. Um, and then it's okay to not be. And there's, there are a lot of people who they aren't innately creative. When they walk into a room, they literally think to themselves, what are the rules and how do I best operate in this environment? And that's very, very positive. Thank God for those people. Right. We need and them then somewhere. there's a whole different group of people. They walk into the room. They go, I see the rules. Now, how would I break them, change them? What else would I do? How would I tweak this? My challenge is I'm like, I'm sorry, did you say rule? I'll do the opposite. Thank you. That's, well, I have the exact <laughs> same challenge. Is it's that like a rule? Really like, good. Let's break it. Did someone tell me I can't do that? Obviously, I'm I can. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, I swear. I mean, I think people who know me well know that they really want me to do something to set it up as something I shouldn't or can't do. And then I will absolutely tackle it. Exactly. I want to I want to take this conversation just in the essence of time also down to a, a very kind of tactical real level because you have a lot of great expertise and thoughts around goal setting. Um and what's interesting I think about that is that most people I would say we reset the same goals year after year. Every maybe maybe it's January 1, maybe some version. Yeah, right? some like, version. But it's basically the same thing. So there's two levels to this question. Let me ask them both and you can More kind of, money. More money and less fat. Right. Totally. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to write that, by the way, on my next New Year's napkin. Money, fat. <laughs> and with arrow up, arrow down. Um, I want to ask you two questions in that, though, so you can kind of tackle it in the right way. One is, why do we fail over and over again? And the second is, the la second layer to that is, if we keep failing, why do we keep resetting? So first of all, it's not that we ever actually fail. It's that we are – we hold ourselves accountable to standards that don't exist. And typically the standard that we're holding ourselves to is unexamined and the actual thing that we're trying to accomplish is to survive even though we're already accomplishing that. So most of the time, we more money is a survival tactic. Less fat is a survival tactic. But you and I, we already have kids. So we can be fat or thin or whatever, whatever we've already, we've already fulfilled on our genetic outcome. So fat or thin equals babies. That's it. That's the point of fat and thin. Money is about survivability, longevity, status in the environment so that I can, I can, um, uh, thrive longer. So the first part of it, the failure part, is really examining what am I actually trying to accomplish? And ultimately, with reflection, and this is really the work that I do with, with people on Wall Street all the time, is you're trying to accomplish something you already have, which is why it is so frustrating to you because you keep saying, what I have isn't right. And that's just, a, that's just what I call the drunk monkey in our head. The second part of it, though, is really getting clear about what you actually want. And what I found is people want to have an experience. That's what they're looking for. And so I have questions that I ask, and it's just about getting to the highest level of experience. It's something that I learned in my NLP training back in the day, which is what's important about making more money? And then you might go, well, I want to be able to pay off these bills and do these things. You go, that's awesome. Then you ask yourself again, what's important about paying off those bills and doing those things? And then you get a little deeper and you say, well, you know, I really want to want to just have a little more, you know, freedom and ability to do the things that I want. I just feel like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm bogged down with these bills. And you say, great. Ultimately, let's go into the future. You've paid off the bills. You have all the stuff. You're living the life you want to live. You're doing all the things you want to do. Ultimately, what will all of that do for you? And people end up talking about various experiences that they want to have. I would just be happy. I would be at peace. I would feel empowered. And then guess what you do? 
you simply set a goal to experience that instead of the outcome. Blow off the outcome because when you're empowered and you're a creative being and you're committed to stuff, all of the results come when you just start to geek out on the experience now. That is enlightened goal setting. So I'm just taking a note here as you're talking because I was like, oh, note to self tomorrow, redo how I set my goals. Um, so if I hear you right, really what you're saying is get to the feeling and the experience that you want out of, you know, making more money, losing 15 pounds. And, and don't worry so much about that tangible outcome of it. That'll happen as a result of the other stuff versus the other way around. And to go one step deeper, recognize that you already have that experience all over the place in your life. And the more you begin to acknowledge it the faster you feel like, oh, I've made it already. Because once you know that you've made it, now you could do whatever you want. And as soon as you could do whatever you want, there's your innovator mind. There's your creativity. There's your resourcefulness. Is that like saying, I heard a quote the other day, someone, it was something like, don't quit when you want to quit. Meaning, um, don't quit when you're down and out. If you want to stop doing something, stop, but do it from a place of power not from a, a place of victim or negativity. Is that kind of, I, I don't know if I'm making sense here, but is that kind of the same thing of like, when you get to that place of being super grateful for everything you have, your decisions, your feelings, your mindset come from such a strong place that that innovation, that creativity, that collaboration, that empowerment, whatever that is that you want to feel comes much more naturally because you're not coming from a place of deficit. Yeah. And let's be honest, <clears throat> deficit, the, the problems and the challenges are the, the inspiration for all of our innovation and nature. We are nature. Nature is placing bets, looking for ways to make things more cohesive and flowing and um, enjoyable and workable and fluid, et cetera. And if we can relate to the problems like, ooh, how fun, then you're going to come up with you – know, first of all, your experience of solving the problem is way better. And second of all, you're likely going to be much more innovative because you'll be more inclusive. You'll be more collaborative. You'll be more open-minded. You, you're not going to be in a retracted, myopically focused, fearful state. This is a problem. The world is broken, and until we solve it, we're all going to be miserable, right? I mean that state does not cause tremendous innovation. It causes tremendous action but not tremendous innovation. So I mean, if people just go on to YouTube and they search Matthew Ferry goal setting, they'll see I have a, I have like a little 15 minute process that I put up for people to go through and get to that. Awesome. Well, we'll get the link from you and put it in the show notes. Um, I, I, I'm intrigued by what you said about that action versus innovation that sometimes we, and I think it's like busy is the new, like, you know, um, badge of success, even though it's the worst thing ever, in my opinion. The and that's how we look at other people. It's like, oh my gosh, he's so busy. He's so successful. Look how busy he is. But to your point, you're in a lot of action. That doesn't mean you're actually in a place of innovation. My goal is to sleep more. <laughs> I've been trying two. to sleep into like ten every single day, and <laughs> oh just see gosh. what how that do you does. Do that with kids? You know what I'm saying? You see how that freaks people out? Like, wait a second, we're uh, not going to survive <laughs> if everybody sleeps until ten. <laughs> Newsflash, everybody, we're not in a survival game. You know, it's funny. I um, I get up at 4 a.m. by choice, but I nap. So I made it part of my kind of goals for this couple months is to nap three times a week because, I'll, you know, I'll end up getting busy and I'll skip it. But my goal is also to sleep more. I do it a little bit differently. But I people were like, well, how can you take a nap in the office? I was like, well, simple. I turn my chair. I close my eyes. And I fall asleep. <laughs> it's pretty simple, actually. And it really works. <laughs> I know. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention is when you're saying about when you're coming from a place of retraction or deficit, don't you also find that you then settle for incremental thinking and ideas because you're so f like in such a flurry to get to something you can hold on to that you don't actually have the space to get to those bigger, bolder, I guess as you'd say it, right, more enlightened thinking and ideas. You settle for what kind of what you can take action on quickly. 
Yeah, and I would suspect that you accomplish, but you aren't satisfied. And you achieve, but you feel unfulfilled. Whereas when you recognize that nothing you do actually matters, that we're all going to die, and that we are some infinite field, some quantum field that all of our electrons, protons, and neutrons are expressing from. So on one hand, you're finite, and on the other hand, you're infinite. And when you can play inside of that dance, it just has you go like this, like, (sighs) and when you're in that state, no matter how much you accomplish, you feel good. I want launch readers out there to really pause and think about this difference between you said two things. I thought Matthew were so good. You you feel achievement but not fulfillment, and you feel accomplishment but not satisfied. And I'd be curious for launch readers out there to really dig into their lives and the work that they're trying to accomplish. I know a lot of them are out there trying to do really important things. Which place on those teeter totters that they're actually fitting? I don't know if teeter totters is a word, by the way, but I think we all know what I'm referring to on the playgrounds. Um, Because I think there's a big difference. Before I ask you the last question, where can people go to connect and learn more? Check me out at MatthewFerry.com, which is M-A-T-T-H-E-W-F-E-R-R-Y.com. And yeah, I got I you know I'm blogging all the time and making videos. You can also um, find us uh, on Facebook and maybe come if you if it in, inspired you. Check out the Spiritual Hooligan group. Mm. Is that on Facebook? Is that a closed group on there. Facebook or is that somewhere else? Yeah, but yeah, it's a closed group on Facebook. But, you know, anybody who wants to join, we let them join because we figure if you can identify yourself as a spiritual hooligan, come hang out with us. <laughs> right. If that speaks to you. That's right. <laughs> you, you are already – that's the first hurdle right there. You know that they're the right person for the group. Yep, exactly. Um, so my last question for you because I can't even believe we're out of time is what's one piece of advice you would have for launch readers out there looking to create their enlightened goals or life? If they're going to create an enlightened set of goals, forget about the outcome, which doesn't mean that you're irrationally irresponsible. It, you, you're going to be outcome oriented, but put your attention on the experience you think the outcome is going to create and then have that experience in the smallest ways as much as possible every single day. And I promise you, the outcomes that you're committed to will accelerate because they will become less relevant and urgent. Let me ask you a last question on that, um, because a lot of people I've heard lately have talked about um, how you shouldn't set goals. You should set actions you want to take, like I'm going to drink eight glasses of water five days a week and I'm going to work out four days a week and I'm not going to worry about the goal of 15 pounds, less body fat, whatever. Do you would you do you attach actions to that then, or do you really just focus sure. on the bigger 100%. thing? Sure, hundred percent. No, hundred percent. Atta- you know, all the normal goal setting processes are best practices that people have been following for millennia. So you do that, but the the it really comes down to the quality. Is the quality of your goal achievement? Out of a false urgency that somehow you're going to accomplish something that will then satisfy an inner thing that will never be satisfied because you're following rules that don't exist? Or is your goal setting a creative expression and the joy of being alive and the recognition that nature is expressing itself through you and this new innovation is just the latest version of nature placing a bet to see if something cool will happen. I love the idea of just thinking of life as just nature placing a bet. It just makes it kind of like I'm some hustler on a side street in a good way, you know, like I'm just placing a bet. Hey, I'm going to roll the dice and I'm going to see what happens. That's right. (laughs) Well, the good news is, is that uh, we can see that enlightenment in general seems to be taking hold as a as a evolutionary anomaly. And and it feels like um, hatred, anger, greed, grudges, um, victimizing, power struggles, etc. Those seem to be uh, no longer appropriate. And just as a species, we're kind of like, whoa, whoa, hey. 
uh, there's this new thing. It's called love and kindness. You know, a bunch of people have been talking about it for a long time. But <laughs> hey, what if we actually did it? We used to live like that in our tribes, but that's okay. <laughs> we, we, maybe we should get back to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I meant to ask you this earlier. So if you don't mind, I'm going to throw in one last question because I know you work with a lot of different types of people without giving away anybody's confidential information or, you know, who they are. I'm just curious if you can kind of quickly share with us a story of some transformation of maybe where I'm curious kind of where and how they were stuck or how that manifested in their work and their life. And then what the result of kind of getting to that next place, um, what that looked like for them. Yeah. So I remember um, one of my clients being um, mired in, in rage, like the littlest things would just set him off. And he, he couldn't figure out why nobody wanted to play with him. He was an innovative, creative guy. He had amazing ideas, but he kept getting shut down or dismissed from various groups and, and passed over for promotions. And, and when we started to work with each other, we began to examine where are these hidden motives to survive? What are you actually trying to accomplish? And we discovered that – Deep inside of him was this feeling that people didn't think I was smart, and because they didn't think I was smart, I have to prove to them that I'm smart, and every time I don't get acknowledged that I'm smart, I am pissed about it because it is a threat to my existence. When he saw that, like, boom, it popped out. It was like, Neil on the Matrix, (gasps) oh my God, wait a second, the whole thing is a program. When he saw that, all of a sudden, he was able to say, well, what am I actually committed to? And he realized what he was committed to was being innovative, doing things that will really make a difference. He was working on on Wall Street, or still is, and he made the decision that his objective was to create something that would help the common man invest in things that only the biggest hedge funds could have access to. And he ended up pulling the perfect guy into his world, and they started this new startup, which was a completely innovative, ballsy thing to do. And within five years, they have literally double-digit billions under management, and the whole premise of the company is based on kindness, being humble, And being focused. So it isn't just we're kind, kumbaya, you know, all skipping, right? It's like, and we're skilled and we're badasses and we make shit happen. I love the combination of that. And there's another thing in there that you said that I really appreciate that we'll have to get to in another podcast, which is, you know, when you're playing at that frequency, you also attract the right people. So when your client that you were just talking about switched his his thoughts and his mindset, the right people showed up. And it's funny how that always works that way, doesn't it? We are we are always um, we're always behaving in a way that has the people around us feel like they're the right people in our life. So if I change my way of behaving, I'm going to change the people that are in my life. I love it. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for joining me. I think we're going to have to have you back just to talk about more of like when if we're all connected and the attraction and how we get the right people in our life, because there's a whole nother kind of, I think, big just aha in that, too. Oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm 100% yes. Let's do it. Before you go, interesting, right? A little different. I found the part about all those illogical rules we hold on to particularly interesting. So here's what I want you to do. Get a blank piece of paper and a pen. And I want you to mind map all the rules in your life and work, all the ones that you hold on to. Don't judge. Just get them all down. I bet after doing that, you'll find some really illogical ones in there that aren't serving you and that are actually holding you back from your next big idea. So go mind map and then, hey, do me a favor. If, a favor. Did you hear how I said that? <laughs> I was like with an accent. Do me a favor. If you have a sec, I would be so excited if you would go onto iTunes and write us a review about the value that you get out of Inside Launch Street. As I always say, more reviews equals greater guests, more guests, great guests, which equals more insights for you. All right, Tamara out. 
Thanks for hanging out with us inside Launch Street. When you're ready to take your game to the next level, join the thousands of others that are upping their innovation edge on GoToLaunchStreet.com, the top online education resource and community platform for innovators looking to use innovation to get measurable results. Go to LaunchStreet.com.